I'm so excited today to step into this new series that's called Three Steps to Change My Life. Say three steps to change my life. Turn to your neighbor and say, change your life. Come on, turn to the other one that's a little further away. Find somebody you don't know. Look at them straight in the eye and say, change your life. Change your life. Because if you gave God your life last week or last decade, God still wants to change you. <laughs> Is anybody perfect? Oh, great. No liars in the house. We got, we're good. So nobody's perfect. So you're still being perfected by God right now. The Holy Spirit, at your moment of decision to give your life to Jesus, comes and dwells in you. And none of us are perfect. doesn't matter if it was last week, literally, when you made that decision, or if it was five years ago, ten years ago. We're all still growing and being perfected, growing into the image of Christ. So whether you have a long history with Jesus or a very short one, I can tell you, He wants to change you. He wants to move in you. And He does really want to change your life. So as we start the series this week, I want to kick this off by talking about the pandemic. And not the pandemic that has been a part of every conversation, it seems, that I've had for the past 12 months. I'm talking about the pandemic that has been present for this entire century. We are living in the age of anxiety. Before corona ever came around, Mental illness was everywhere in our country, but the number one mental illness, anxiety. Before corona, so before COVID wrecked our lives over the past year, before that, already 70% of Americans reported having chronic levels of stress. So all of that pre-corona, now add on everything that we've went through in the past 12 months, and you can see why there are a whole lot of people who are just feeling real stressed out and very anxious. I just feel stressed out right now. I don't know why I feel stressed out. I just do. I'm worried about my job. I'm worried about the economy. I'm worried about politics. I'm worried about racial tension. I'm worried about all those crazy people who are wearing their masks. I'm worried about all those crazy people who think... You have to wear a mask. I'm worried about those people who act like nothing happens and you don't have to wear a mask. I'm just worried. I don't know what I'm really worried about now. I just, I'm just so anxious. It's been so long. I don't know where I stand. I just know how I feel and I feel worried and I don't know why. I just feel anxious. Yet the Bible gives us these words. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So today's first step in seeing your life changed is choosing to overcome anxiety. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we need you now. As we said today, Lord, we're not enough unless you come. We realize that. We realize that we need you now. We need you here. So come, Holy Spirit. Open our hearts. Open our minds to receive your word. And Lord, help us to see how we can actually choose to overcome this ill that we see all around us, probably at least at moments in our lives too but how we can walk in victory and actually overcome anxiety. We ask these things boldly in the name of Jesus. If you agree, say amen. Amen. So let's talk about anxiety, worry, and your brain. So God created us. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, he also created you. You're the apple of his eye, the pinnacle of of creation and God created our bodies and how we function it's just amazing how all of this works God created you a certain way God is the God of science right God is not at odds with science science proves God for anybody to think that they're at odds with each other is ridiculous science proves the existence of an almighty and God created you and molded you and fashioned you well one of the things he gave us is a brain. And even though it's easier to see in some than others, he, he gave us a brain 
And he <laughs> gave it to us to do specific things. He gave us this brain to reason, to choose between different paths, to you know, weigh and evaluate things and see which course of direction we're going. And from the brain, it sends all these messages throughout our body and tells the rest of the parts of our body things to do, how to do it. And there's a specific portion of our brain, a tiny little part, it's about the size uh, of an acorn, and it's shaped like that. It's called the amygdala. Everybody say amygdala. The amygdala is this little tiny part of the brain, but it's armed for survival. It's armed to protect us. It's the part of our brain that clicks in when there's a stimulus in the environment, something happens, maybe you hear a loud noise and you're on guard. That's the thing that says, hey, maybe you need to protect yourself, survey the environment. You're, you're on the edge of your seat just in a matter of the moment. That's the amygdala that's working. It's the amygdala if you've ever been in a moment and you don't exactly know why or how and you're not even thinking, but you just react. That's the amygdala working. It's that fight or flight reaction, if you've ever heard of that. It's where we get this impulse to, I've either got to run and get out of here really fast, I've got to get away from the problem, or I'm about to take on the problem. Like, come at me. And most of us are wired one way or another. Uh, are there any, like, fight people? You know, like, that's what you do? Yeah. Flight people? Other people just know people? I don't know. <laughs> you have an amygdala... <laughs> You have an amygdala. So we're, most of us are wired in most situations. We'll just do one or the other. We're either going to fight or flight. So if you've never seen this, I found a few examples I just wanted to share with you guys to show what it looks like. If you can, Nick, show us this first example. Let's see how this guy deals with it. Run. <laughs> he, he was flight. There was just a random guy that came around the corner saying, run, and he jumped in the bush. Just because it's fun. Can you show us that again? That's kind of fun. All right. Run. I don't know. He just jumps. So this guy is flight. It's just what he does. He jumps behind bushes when people run at him. So let's check out this next guy and see how he handles a crazy Tyrone, fast stimulus. Are you in going trick treating? No, probably not. <laughs> fantastic this guy reacts differently right so something happens boom he's ready to punch the guy in the face the other guy's jumping in the bush but this is not strange did you notice how afterwards the second guy's like walking away and kind of laughing like what did i just do he wasn't thinking right he just reacted it's not weird or strange that it happens god gave you this amygdala and it was functioning as it should in both of those situations now, how you react and what you do is going to be different from person to person. One person might jump in bushes. The next person might punch somebody in the face. It's just the amygdala that's working because God gave you that part of your body to protect you. It's working as it should. But the problem is the amygdala is not very uh, objective. It doesn't take into account everything that's really going on in the moment. It's simply there, and it's hardwired to protect us. And the interesting thing is the amygdala is very easily triggered. So, for example, when my wife Chelsea uh, sees a spider, it doesn't matter to her how big the spider is. It doesn't matter that it ain't coming straight at her. It doesn't matter if it's poisonous or not, or that she realizes if she thought about it, she could literally just crush it under her foot. What happens when my wife sees a spider is she screams, or she balls up, or she comes to get me so that I can kill it. That's what happens. Chelsea in that moment is not being rational. She is reacting because something happens in her that triggers when I see a spider, boom, this is how I react. It's her amygdala that's working in that moment. It makes her act that way. That's why the amygdala needs a little help. God created this full functioning body, right? We all have a part in the body of Christ. It's just like in the brain, one part, if it was only an amygdala, can you imagine how your life would be? 
Just immediate, boom, boom, punch in the face, punch in the face, punch in the face, run away, punch in the face. It'd be this over and over and over. We have these different parts so that they function together. Much like when you're gone or you're not doing what God created you to do, we all suffer because we need you doing your part. God gave us a brain with multiple parts that function together. See, the amygdala needs help from another part called the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is the logical part of our brain. It's the part that reasons. It's the part that says, here's some things going on. Now let me weigh them out. Let me choose which would be the best course of action based on what I know. It helps us make informed decisions. It weighs options. It does things logically. So if you're in the house at night, it's dark, it's quiet, and there's a your amygdala is screaming, you're going to die, you're going to die, you're going to die. But it's your prefrontal cortex that comes in and says, no, it's probably just the cat. It's probably just that old house noise that you hear every night. Maybe something fell in the fridge. You're not going to die. It's going to be okay. The amygdala needs the prefrontal cortex, and the prefrontal cortex needs the amygdala. See, the thing about the amygdala is it responds to pre-programming. Now, I know this has just been kind of like, I don't know, school or something so far, but don't miss this. This is important. The amygdala responds to programming that's already there. It responds to things that have happened in your past that have wired you to think a certain way. So, for example, if you heard a loud noise five or ten years ago, and it didn't turn out to be something falling in the fridge, or the cat knocking something over. But it turned out there actually was in the middle of the night. You're sleeping, you're vulnerable, you hear something loud, and when you get up, there's actually somebody in your home, and they rob you. And at gunpoint, you barely escape with your life because you say, take everything, it's okay, uh, you can have it, and they flee. From that point forward, whenever you hear a loud noise at night now, you immediately, boom, at attention. You immediately are ready with a bat or a gun or whatever, like you're either searching the house if you're a fight person or you're hiding under the covers in your favorite place to get away if you're a flight person. But whenever you hear that noise, it sets off something in you and something is triggered. And your amygdala helps you react. Why? Because of pre-programming. Now, if you were, I don't know, left alone as a child accidentally sometime. Maybe the pre-programming in your mind is this irrational fear of being left alone. Maybe you watched the movie It when you were young and you have an irrational fear of clowns now. I don't know what it is for you. I don't know what the specific trigger is, but based on what you have experienced before, your amygdala will respond to this pre-programming in your brain and from your history that says, when this happens, this is how I react. When this happens, boom, it's how I react. I don't know why I actually feel this way. I don't even know why I react how I do. It's just when this thing happens, when a certain stimulus comes into my life, I just think this way. I just act this way, and I don't even really know why I'm doing it. And now all of a sudden, this trigger's happened. And where one moment ago I was perfectly fine, now I find myself overwhelmed by fear. I find myself overwhelmed by tension. Possibly I can't breathe well. Possibly my brain's rushing to all of these worst case scenarios. And what do I do? Well, the amygdala tries to tell me to react. Is I'm going to fight? I'm going to go after something? Or I'm going to run away? Either way, it means I'm probably going to shut down. It means I'm probably not going to be able to think logically about what's going on in my life. And all of these things are happening at once. It's happening in a moment. And now I find myself overwhelmed by fear, anxiety, tension, and I don't know what to do with myself. The amygdala is on overload. And I'm trying to control things. I can't control and do things that I actually don't have the power to do, but I just try to reach for them because in the moment, that's what my mind says I should do. Yet the Bible says, do not be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious about anything. So that situation, that financial problem, my kids, your love life, your job. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation. Because let me tell you, if it's on your mind, it's on God's heart. 
in every situation, anything that you could face. God sees you. He sees what you're going through. It says, in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And then what's going to happen? The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So we're trying not to be anxious. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by what? Prayer. Somebody say prayer. By prayer and petition, present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your what? Minds in Christ Jesus. Prayer. Man, prayer is powerful. Tell your neighbor, you got to pray. Come on, tell him. Say, you got to pray. You got to pray. The scripture says here that we don't have to be anxious about anything. That means we don't have to be anxious about anything. Hey, you know what anything means? Anything. That's what it means. You don't have to be anxious. You don't have to be anxious about anything anything paying your bills you don't have to be anxious about it your future you don't have to be anxious about it finding that spouse you've been praying for don't have to be anxious about it god says you don't have to be anxious for anything but instead by communicating with god prayer and petition we present our requests to god that's praying it's merely talking to god when you find yourself in that moment of i don't really know what to do you take your request straight to him he already knows what you're going through but he tells us, he says, bring it to me. Tell me what's on your mind. Tell me what's on your heart right now because I see you and I care. And when we bring it to him, when we pray to him, something's going to move because prayer moves things. Prayer moves things in the spirit. But all the time, it seems like people discount the value of prayer. I mean, Christians included. How many times have you heard Christians, non-Christians, it's, it's this, well, all we can do now is pray. <laughs> uh, really? That, that's all we can do now? I mean, I can only imagine like God's up in heaven like, really, that, that's all you can do is talk to me, the creator of heaven and earth, the one that gave you breath, the one that gives you everything good, the one that gives you life and joy and peace. That, that's all you can do? Like, that's really all you can do? It's like, when people even talk about prayer, there's this defeatist attitude. Well, that's all we got left now. I guess we'll pray. <laughs> and as Christians, I, I feel like we know it here, you know, but we don't know it. That, that prayer is this connection with God and that prayer is actually powerful. That we have a direct line to the creator of the universe and that he actually cares and sees us. He cares what's going on in our lives. But prayer, it seems, gets relegated to this back seat of the room kind of thing. Prayer should never be our last line of defense. It should be our first line of offense. It's what we do first. It's our initial reaction. It's not to control everything that I can. Let me try everything I know how to do first, and then if it doesn't work out, well, you know, prayer is all we got. No, it's, this is my first line of offense I go to the Father because I know He's the one who's got the answer anyway. He holds the answer in His hand. He is the one that owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's the one who has the ability to bring me my wife in due season. He is the one who has the ability to rectify and reconcile and do things that in your power have you figured out you're not able to do. But He is the one who has the ability to just drop it in in His timing. Hebrews 4 says, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to quote it right. It says something like you can come to the throne of grace and God will give you grace and mercy in our time of need. James 4 says you have not because you ask not. Like prayer is powerful. Like maybe if we'd actually go and ask, we may just receive. Yet we don't go to God until we get backed into a corner and we literally don't know what to do. Well, I don't have anything left I can do. I guess at this point, after I've screwed everything up, this is when I'll go to God. This is what I'll do. You, you want to see your life change? Make prayer your first resort. 
Make it your first priority. It'll change your life. Go to God first and see what starts to move and change from what your normal ways of experiencing things has gotten you. Your normal ways of going about life has got you here. You want to see your life change? I'd say, let's make prayer first priority. It's going to God first. Now God's the thing I run to. It's not to just my friends. Your friends aren't bad. No, you need people in your life. I don't go to just my family or, you know, my horoscope or whatever else you like to consult. I'm going to go to God first. He's the one that I cling to. He's the one that I run to. God, I don't even know what I need right now, but I feel this happening. I'm scared. I'm starting to feel anxious. I don't know what to do with myself, but I know that I need you. Will you come through for me? Can, can I bring you what I need and you actually hear me? Going to God first and praying will absolutely change your life. And one crazy thing about prayer is I know that it moves things in the spiritual. I believe that prayer moves the heart of God. But prayer actually changes us. Praying to God changes us. See, for decades, neurologists believed that our brains did not change after adolescence. That's what they thought for decades. Now, since then, they have realized they were wrong. Thank goodness. Sometimes scientists are wrong. I don't know if you knew that. Um, but this is one place I'm actually glad they're wrong. How many, who else is glad your brain didn't stop developing at 14? You're glad you're not frozen in that state. Yeah, that, that, would be, that would be not good. So they got that wrong. What they have realized is our brain continues to develop our entire life. It's continually shaping and then reshaping. It is called a neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity. It means our brain is constantly evolving. New experiences, new things constantly take our brain and shapes it, and then it's shaped over and over and over again. And when we pray, it literally changes the chemistry in our brain. There's a lady named Dr. Caroline Leaf. She's been studying the brain for the last 30 years or so. And she said it has been found that 12 minutes, 12 minutes of daily Focused prayer over an eight-week period can change the brain to an extent that it can be measured on a brain scan. Wow. Twelve minutes a day of focused prayer over eight weeks. And it literally changes the chemistry inside of your brain to an extent that they pick it up on a brain scan. Like I said earlier, science proves God. It doesn't disprove God. Literally praying shows up in tests that can be run now, just as these toxic thoughts, toxic ways of reacting whenever stimulus happens, I react this way, just as those things embed themselves in our brains and cause things to die, cause harm in our lives, prayer literally rewires, reshapes, and renews our mind. Science has proven it now. Now, why does all of that happen? I really am fascinated by this. I won't go off on the deep end too much. This is not in my notes. But there's these things called neural pathways. These neural pathways are kind of like these things in your brain where these things connect and they take the easiest path. Basically, it's like if you went to a park and there's all these paths you can take that are pre-arranged. Like, hey, you can take the one-mile hike, which is the one I like, or you can take the 10-mile hike, which is the one Chelsea likes. Like, either way, they're, they're these beaten-down paths that somebody has already tried, right? And the impetus for most of us is to go on the well-beaten path. It's easier. It's easier to go on these paths that have been walked a lot of times before. Now, you could go to the park, and you could go through the grass and climb over trees and go over ravines and eventually get to your destination wherever you wanted to go, but most of us are going to take a path that's beaten down, right? Same thing in our brains. The more times we do something over and over and over again, these neural pathways are created. And when you react a certain way or do something a certain way so many times... These neural pathways are created, and it takes you from point A to point Z like that. What happens with neuroplasticity, though, 
is it doesn't mean that you have to stay in these neural pathways. The more you do something new or a different way, you can actually create these different new and neural pathways that will get you away and different from an old way of doing things. So if you grew up and you actually experienced that robbery in your house and you, boom, react a certain way, it doesn't mean that you always have to react that way. There's hope for you. I could tell you about the hope biblically. I want to tell you what science is even proving now that we knew biblically already. If I do something different and make my mind up that I want to change it, actually in my mind it can be rewired because my brain is that powerful. God created it that way where I don't have to stay stuck in the exact same reaction my whole life. I don't have to have anxiety my whole life just because I always have. I don't have to stay in this wiring. Science has even shown now that my brain itself and how I choose to react can be rewired. So if I'm a Christian and I'm following Jesus, and I already know this verse, it's, it's probably the most quoted verse I had last year. Because I'm not so unlike you just because I'm a pastor, things affect me too. I experience anxiety too. I wish I could say I've conquered it and I never deal with it. But I quoted this verse more than any other verse to myself last year. I know this verse. I'm a Christian. I'm walking with Jesus. So why, why is a Christian, why, why as Christians do we walk with Jesus? We can know what the Bible says, but yet I come into this situation and I feel anxiety. Why is it that I can know all this stuff, but I still feel how I feel? Well, science would say that we're experiencing an amygdala hijack. Amygdala hijack. Basically, the amygdala's reaction of fight or flight in this really irrational way of thinking so takes over your body that it feels like I can't think or react any other way. It bypasses all of the logical stuff that would happen in your prefrontal cortex. And it hijacks your body and your mind. And now all of a sudden, one stimulus has taken me down this road. And what do I start to do? I just react. I just start to breathe faster. I start to stay up at night because I can't sleep. Maybe I eat everything in sight because I think it's going to comfort me. Maybe my heart start beating. I, can't, I literally feel tension in my chest. My body says, oh, you need to do more stuff. Think about this more or it's going to turn out worse. You, do not really can, you can't really control this, but you feel like you can. You need to not sleep because if you don't focus on it, it's just going to get worse. And your brain and your body are in this total terrible spiral because there's been an amygdala hijack. Science would say that's what it's called. Scripture would say we're walking in the flesh. <laughs> we're letting our pre-Jesus nature, our carnal nature, dominate my renewed nature. I'm letting the flesh dominate the spirit instead of the spirit dominate the flesh. In other words, we are worrying. We are not trusting God. And maybe we wouldn't say it like that because, you know, as a Christian, it don't feel good to say, you know, I'm really just not trusting God. Maybe we wouldn't put it in those terms, but really, isn't that what it is a lot of times? God, I, I've heard this. I, 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 I've maybe even experienced your goodness before, but in this situation, I just don't trust you. I don't, I don't trust you. I don't think that you care about what I care about right now. And so since you're not going to worry about me, I've got to worry about this. And we're not trusting God. Ultimately, it's us not trusting him and his word and his promises for our life. We make a choice that we are going to trust ourselves what we can do, what we can think of, the things we can try to manipulate and control instead of trusting God. Instead of letting this Holy Spirit that now dwells in me control my thoughts, I'm letting my sinful nature run my life. Romans chapter 8 says it this way, verse 5 and 6, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mindset on what the Spirit desires. And get this, this is so good. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. That verse is so good, I'm going to read it to you again. The mind governed by the flesh is what? 
death. Can anybody say amen to that? But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Who wants some peace in their life? Come on. The mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. So I've got to choose to let my mind be governed by the Spirit. I've got to choose life and peace. See, when I choose to live according to the flesh, carnal desires, old ways of thinking, old ways of doing things, reacting in a moment, when I choose to react that way, the result is death. But I'm going to choose to direct the logical part of my brain to lean into the spiritual. I'm going to tell the logical part of my brain how this looks scientifically. I'm telling my prefrontal cortex to grab my amygdala by the tail and say, hey, quit being crazy. Quit being irrational. We're going to trust God here because I know God's word and I'm choosing to trust it. I'm choosing to have faith in this moment. I'm choosing to put this down and let this go because I'm ready to trust God and not be anxious about this anymore. Science says, I'm going to let my logical mind press into the spiritual. I'm not going to let that other part control me anymore. So when my irrational fears start to run wild within me, when my worry starts to spin out of control, what I do is I stop, I grab that thought, and I make it obedient to Christ. I put it under Christ. Just because it happened doesn't mean I'm going to react like this anymore. Just because the stimulus happened, and most of my life I always react like this, and I go into cowering, I go into not sleeping, I go into worry until I cry and I don't know what to do anymore. No, now I'm going to choose to trust what the Word of the Lord says. I'm not going to let my sinful nature run my mind anymore. I'm choosing to let the Holy Spirit direct my thoughts and my life now. And the opportunity... For worry is going to continue to come. Even though I know this and this is truth, this is one of those points in the message where I get to smile at you and say, life's going to keep being life. The opportunities for you to worry and become illegitimately anxious are going to be plenty because that is life. Whether it's a legitimate worry or it's a very illegitimate thing that you can take it and run with, these opportunities are just going to keep coming. It's true for all of us. But the good news is we're not alone in this. Okay? So not only do you have people around you who want to do life with you, one more reason to get in a grow group, you need people in your life. You're not made to do this life alone. You're not made to walk through and make these decisions and worry about everything and carry it alone. There's people around you who want to do life with you. Get in a grow group. Come on, say, get in a group. Get in a group. Come on, help me preach this to somebody. Get in a group. So you have people around you. You're not alone in this. But also, and most importantly, we have God in this with us. But what do we do many times as Christians when we're trying to overcome anxiety and worry? We have worry in our lives. You know the pastor tells you at least that people are with you. You hear that God's with you. But you still have worry in your life. Many times, at least I can speak for me, in our life we have worries. And as Christians we at least try to give these worries to God. We at least attempt to hand them off, right? So whether it's, you know, relationship, job money we take our worries and we give them to god and then we wait we wait it's been 15 minutes and nothing's changed so now what am i doing i'm taking all my worries back from god i'm getting them back to me because nothing happened how i wanted to how i wanted it to or when i wanted it to so lord i tried to give you those worries but i didn't really like how you did it so i'm taking them back now you didn't respond in my timing anybody else 
We try to get our worries now, and now we're carrying them again. Oh, I gave it up to the Lord, but now just a few days, a few moments later, it didn't happen like I wanted it to. So now again, I'm burdened with something that I'm not supposed to be burdened with. Something I cannot control is now controlling me. And it's all I think about. And it's wrecking my life. It's wrecking my other relationships. It's wrecking my health. It's wrecking my sleep. But yet, you know, I'm not going to trust God with this anymore because God didn't do it fast enough or how I wanted it to. So you know, God, I'm not going to trust you with this right now. Why? Well, it may be that your God is too small and your worries are too big. And maybe somebody here outside of me needs a little bigger picture of God in their life and your worries need to get a little smaller. And now it's not that God has changed, <laughs> but my vision of God and who He is in my life has gotten a lot bigger. And now I actually start to see God more as He is. That as big as my worries are, as many as it seems like I've got, God is big enough for my worries. And my life starts to change because not that things stop in my life, not that stress stops being a real thing in my life, but now my God finally appears as he is, which is much bigger than my worries. And we all got worries. I don't want you to think that it's weird for you to have worries or things that concern you. We've all got worries. Things still worry me. We carry these things around. And some of them are very legitimate some of them are very illegitimate. I remember, like, what, what worries me, like, when I was, uh, just in the last few years, when, when we had Amaris in August, one of my very illegitimate worries that I carried around, I always got scared they weren't breathing at night. Just all the time. I would go in and check them when they go to bed, and I'd, like, put my ear up literally to their ear. And then it'd wake them back up, and then we have to put them to bed again. And we go through this process. I, before I go to bed, I'd be like, I can't, I can't, see the, I can't see them moving. I would literally go up and see if the covers were rising up as they breathe on their stomach. And if I couldn't, I'd get even closer, and then wake them up again. And I'm putting them to bed again. I can't tell you how many hours of sleep that I lost in this ridiculous process. Because I was worried, I feel like illegitimately, about my kids dying in the middle of the night. It's just what I worried about. I'm talking every night of the week. Ridiculous. Yep. yep, says my wife in the front row. She knows it. What do I worry about now? Some things still illegitimate, some things very legitimate. One of my biggest worries as a pastor, especially right now at this moment in history, is being perceived the wrong way. Even when I know I'm, gonna, I'm just going to tell what the Word says, do you know how fast things can blow up now? You know how easy it is to get canceled because you tell the truth of God's word? And even though you tell the truth or you try to do it in the best way you can and you're imperfect, I worry that I'm going to misrepresent God or I'm going to stomp people's toes so hard that they don't even want to hear the word of God anymore. I'm worried about things. Still, that's something I deal with. It's something all of us have. Some of them very legitimate, some very illegitimate. But what do I want to do as a Christian? What's my goal? It's eventually to take all of my worries and to see them as so small now and my God so big, I'm going to go and give all of my worries to God. And now, not only in my worries, but my entire life is now hidden in God because I want to be hidden in Christ, in the Lord. And now my entire life is hidden in God. And now I don't have anxiety anymore. I don't have worries anymore. Why? Because I have chosen to submit worry, to submit anxiety, to submit all of these things to a God that I see and know as bigger than anything else in my life. It's possible. If we can start to see God for who He is, we can walk this way. And some of you might be thinking, that's ridiculous. <laughs> like, I, I, you don't know my worry, the anxiety I experience is different than anybody else. Some of you might just think that's irresponsible to not worry anymore. 
to not have cares in your life. You know, I'm not talking about being irresponsible. I'm talking about trusting God. I'm talking about trusting the Lord. We trust Him with our salvation. Do you think He doesn't care about your finances? I mean, we're talking about trusting God with our eternal soul. You think He don't see that promotion at work? Or your kids being sick? Or that prognosis you've been given? It doesn't escape Him. I'm not talking about not caring I'm not talking about not worrying. It's not, it's not your new slogan being, don't worry, be happy, or don't worry, do nothing. It's more of, don't worry, trust God. Right. Don't worry because you have a God who loves you and that you can trust with not only your salvation that is eternal, but with your very temporary circumstances. Right. God sees you. See, you should actually care about things that matter. You should care about these things. Earlier in the book of Philippians, where we find this verse that is our core verse of the day don't be anxious for anything the apostle paul writes these words i hope in the lord jesus to send timothy to you soon that i also may be cheered when i receive news about you i have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare so for you people who like to go deeper this is this is one of your moments the the word that's translated here as concern in second in philippians chapter 2 where it says concern for your welfare. It's the same Greek word that's translated anxiety in our core verse. Don't be anxious about anything. Same Greek word, different translation. The translation depends on the context around it. So in one context, this word means concern. The other one, it means anxiety. Concern being legitimate care. Legitimate worry. Concern for the well-being of others being a good thing. In the other instance, illegitimate care, excessive worry, the worries and troubles of this world running your life, bad thing. So if you say this is irresponsible, here's what I want you to know. You can still care and be free of worry. Does that make sense? You can care and be free and set free from anxiety. You can still be and should be invested in situations, invested in people's lives, and also not walk around anxious. It's possible. Your new slogan is don't worry, trust God. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is a promise to us. We can be free of anxiety. So what does this look like? I want to wrap this up by making it really practical. What does it look like to practically walk out a life that is free of anxiety? Well, number one, we're going to pray. We're going to pray. Somebody say pray. pray. First thing I want to do, if I want to walk in a lifestyle of having anxiety-free living, of experiencing the peace of God. We pray. Number one, first and foremost, we pray. It's my first priority. I take things to God now instead of trying to control them and manipulate them and do them all on my own. I pray. Number one. Now we could really just stop the list here. I actually considered, <laughs> I considered making the list and just having number one. That's it. Pray. Because that's what the Bible says. Biblically, it says, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, pray. And then you have peace. We can stop there. The Bible says we can. I believe the Bible. It's God's word. I was going to leave it at one. But if there's anybody else in here who's like needing a little more, and you're like me, and you like lists, <laughs> and you're like, give me something I can actually do when that moment hits and I don't know how to react. Well, first I'm going to start you with pray. Now these other things are things that I've done. I've walked these things out. Don't take them as the word of God, but let me give you something that practically helps, and you just do with it as you will, okay? Number one, I pray, because that's what the Bible says. Number two, I do what I can do. I'm going to do what I can do. So for those of you who think, you know, you're just telling me to sit there and pray and not do anything, not at all. You have legitimate worries, do something about them. If I'm trying to lose weight, I would pray first, because I'd be like, Lord, help me in this because I really like cheeseburgers. 
I really like eating huge baskets of fries and eating really low-class fast food because that's just me. <laughs> that's what I like. So what am I going to do? I'm going to do what I can do. I'm going to pray for the Lord to give me strength, and then I'm actually going to make a plan. Maybe I don't drive by that restaurant that I always want to stop at. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm going to take an alternate route home that I only see trees and pretty things and not rallies or Taco Bell because they always get me. I'm going to do what I can do. I'm going to make a plan to work out and actually stick to it. I'm going to change my diet. I'm going to put things in my budget so if it's more expensive food, I can pay for it because that's part of maybe me getting in shape. I'm going to do what I can do. So I pray, I'm going to do what I can do, and then I'm going to give God what I can't do. I'm going to pray, I'm going to do what I can do because how many of you know we have a role in this? But then... I'm going to give to God everything I cannot do. And there is so much I have realized that I cannot do. And it's not for lack of trying. <laughs> I try to do so many things. Uh, I try to do God's part a lot of times. Sometimes I'm not satisfied with how fast he moves or when he moves or how he moves. And I try to be doing what God should be doing. I've not found much success there. And I found that if I give to God what I cannot do, I start to feel peace and freedom. I may still be frustrated by an outcome, but I don't have to carry it anymore. I've started to let other people just be responsible for their part because I cannot control it. How many of you have realized you cannot control people? You can't control people and what they do. So we give God what we can't do. The things that we cannot control, I give to God. I'm done with trying to reach and grab things that I can't do because all it's doing is stressing me out. It's keeping me up. It's not changing anything. It's just ruining my life. It's making me feel anxious. It's making me to go bed and not even enjoy it. It's making me not be present in the moment with my kids because I'm thinking about something else. It's making me be in this place where I've had three months to get ready for one meeting to see somebody I hadn't seen in months, but my mind is somewhere else because I've got anxiety. And I can't even enjoy the things that God's bringing into my life because I'm trying to control something I can't control. So I give to God what I can't control. And then after I pray and do what I do and give to God what I can't do, number four, I trust God no matter what. Why? Because I just decide to. Because I just know Him. I know His character. I know His heart. I know His faithfulness to me. And even when it seems like something is not how I would ever want it to be, my choice that I make is to trust God no matter what. No matter the outcome. And as we wrap this up, I want you to, for just a moment, imagine having a heart of peace. I want you to imagine for just a moment actually having peace of mind. What it would be like to have joy that is just unending. To cease having illegitimate worry in your life. To have anxiety completely lifted off you. I want to tell you that it's possible. And I also want to tell you it's a choice. Will you choose to trust God? Will you choose to bring everything to him in prayer as your first resort? Will you choose when the stimulus hits to press into the spirit instead of letting your flesh control your thoughts and your emotions and your mind? Will you choose to trust God where he says he will show up and be God where you cannot be? It's a choice. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, we present our request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, we guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. See, the world doesn't give us this peace, so the world can't take it away. It's ours for the taking in Christ. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you really, really vulnerable and real right now.
and we say we need you. God, we've spent so much of our lives trying to do things we don't have any power to do, control things we can't control. And Lord, we're just wore out and tired. And we realize that a lot of this that we're feeling is because of something we've done. There's many things that have been put on us that we had no choice, but Lord, we, we honestly own up to the things that we've gotten ourselves into. And now that we're just dealing with them, Lord, we don't know where to go but you. Lord, I pray that you would help us make you our first resort. Lord, I pray that you would start to move in our lives where we can see joy return, where there's just been mourning, where peace can come back, or maybe for the first time, where all we have felt is worry and anxiety and sleepless nights. God, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. I pray that everybody dealing with any kind of financial thing right now can see that you are the giver of everything good, that you are Jehovah Jireh. You are our provider. And Lord, we trust you over what we see in our bank account. We trust you over the job that gives us income because you are the one who even gives us the ability to have a job and have income. So Lord, we submit every situation, financial, our health situations. We give it all to you, Lord. You're our healer. Lord, we pray that you would show up and be God. Lord, help us to do the things that we can. Help us to not sit on the sidelines and then be mad because checks just aren't coming in the mail after we quit our job and we're sitting on our butt. Lord, help us to do things that we know we should be doing. But then everything we can't do, Lord, we trust it to you. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Have your perfect will in our lives and give us the ability, God, to trust you even when the situation doesn't look like we want it to, Lord. Raise our faith up so that we might know you more. And Lord, I just pray as the pastor of these people, Lord, that you would do something supernatural in their lives, that there would be a grace about them in this area, that they would see victory. I pray for victory over anxiety today. In the name of Jesus, I just pray for the spirit of peace to fall upon people's minds and their hearts. That even tonight, many people would sleep well for the first time in months. And when they hit the ground running tomorrow and life is real again right in their face, that they don't start reacting and going into the same old patterns, but that by your spirit and by the truth that comes from you, by your spirit, that new things can start to play out. Even in their minds, you start to renew it by prayer and, and by them choosing you, Lord, that we choose to lean into the Spirit and instead of the flesh. Lord, we trust you with all these things. And we say we need you now. Come, Holy Spirit, and have your way. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, amen. And if you're here or listening, just staying in the spirit of prayer for one moment. Just very matter of fact, wherever you're at right now, if you've not made that decision because you don't know about this Jesus or you're at a place where you're finally ready to give up the weight that you've been carrying, but you've not yet made a decision to enter into a relationship with God, a real relationship, I want to give you a chance for that. I'm just going to pray with you. You don't have to repeat after me, but pray something similar. If you want Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. If you want to give your life to Him, this is your moment right now. And everybody here is just going to bow their head and close their eyes. We're not trying to point you out. This is between you and God. And I just want to pray with you. And as you give these words the meaning, the Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe that God raised Him from the dead, that you shall be saved. And not only will anxiety start to, to cease and decrease in your life, but you're going to have a real relationship with a God who loves you. So let's pray right now, and if that's you, give these words meaning. God's going to do something real in your heart right now. Father, in Jesus' name, I come to you, and I just say I need you. I've tried to do things my own way, and I turn from that. I want to follow you now. Please forgive me for my sins and heal me. I want a new life in you. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God that he died for my sins on a cross and that he raised on the third day. And I say from this moment forward, my life is yours. I want to follow you and I want to know the true, real meaning of life in you. Come be real in my life, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen, amen. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer, it's the first step in the best decision you're ever going to make. Can we give it up for anybody who made that decision today? Hey, you're not alone. There's people who here who want to do life with you. And just as a reminder, not just here locally where we've seen about 70 people saved in the past two years, but internationally, there's been over 21,000 of you that have made a real decision for Jesus all over the world. And God's really doing something. I don't want you to think you're alone or you're weird or that, or that this is just a fleeting moment or a feeling. God's done something real in your heart and we want to follow up with you. So really get to know us. Come see me. Come see the people that will be in the lobby. We want to know you, do life with you. And if you are online, hit up info at blueprintchurch.tv and we will help connect you to somebody in your area so that you can do life with somebody and not just from long distance, but somebody in your face, in your area, and can uh, walk that out with you.